Welcome back to Intro to Philosophy 1010, our book, The World of Philosophy, an introductory reader by Stephen Kahn, and we are going over On Liberty by John Stuart Mill, the utilitarian. So this was written in 1859, and this essay is about free speech and how why it's so important to protect free speech even when the speech that is being given is totally false and odious to the opinions of the majority. Still, Mill says it should be heard, and he gives reasons why. And this exam, uh, this essay will be covering Exam 5, Part A, Question 1 of Plato, Hobbes, Marx, Mill, and Dewey, which presents the better argument of the relationship of the state to society. And Part B, Explain Mill's harm principle. So the relationship of the state to society for Mill should be limited uh, to protecting people from harm. And that is the harm principle. If what people say or do doesn't harm anybody else, they should be given complete and total liberty to do it. And that is what we'll be going over now. And I think this is especially important for a democratic society, and especially the United States of America. Just to give a little bit of a preface of why I think this is an important essay to, to study. So this is Alexis de Tocqueville, Democracy in America. And it's one of the best, in my opinion, analyses of democracy in America that there is out there, and this is his reflections on the unlimited power of the majority. So in a democracy, there's no monarch, the majority rules, but then the majority becomes the potential tyrant. The tyranny of the majority is the, the, the dark side of democracy. And according to de Tocqueville, he says, I know of no country in which there is so little independence of mind and real freedom of discussion as in America. And, and his point is because, actually, I'll read a little bit here. He says, it, it is, you know, in absolute monarchs in Europe, he says, people can still have their own free opinions and they can talk amongst themselves about how horrible the king is. Um, but... But he says, it is not so in America. As long as the majority is still undecided, discussion is carried on. But as soon as its decision is irrevocably pronounced, everyone is silent. And the friends, as well as the opponents of the measure, unite in assenting to its propriety. The reason for this is perfectly clear. No monarch is so absolute as to combine all the powers of society in his own hands and to conquer all opposition, as a majority is able to do, which is the right both of making and of executing the laws. So if you go against the opinion of the majority, no one will light you on fire, he says, but your political career is closed forever since he has offended the only authority that is able to open it. Every sort of compensation, even that of celebrity, is refused to him. He thought he had friends before he expressed an opinion contrary to the majority. After that, he finds he no longer has any sympathizers. So he says it's this complete enslavement of the mind to the tyranny of the majority, which is more gentle than the despotism of a monarch, and yet much more pervasive and for that reason dangerous. And to compensate for that danger, John Stuart Mill says that society should insist on allowing all free speech, and not only that, should seek out opinions contrary to the majority opinion, because that's the only way you can perfect the opinions of the majority, even if even the true ones. They can never be completely, absolutely perfect, and the best way to find out any missing elements of truth is to collide them with contrary opinions. And with that, I'll just let John Stuart Mill talk. Well, I will read his words. So, chapter one, introductory, this is page 458. He says, the object of this essay is to assert one very simple principle, as entitled to govern absolutely the dealings of society with the individual in the way of compulsion and control, whether the means used be physical force in the form of legal penalties of the, or the moral coercion of public opinion. We just saw De Tocqueville talk about that. 
That principle is that the sole end for which mankind are warranted, individually or collectively, in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their, num of any of their number is self-protection, that the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. So that was the part B question. What is Mill's harm principle? And that is it. But that the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. So if you're saying, well, I'm preventing him from doing something or saying something to protect him from himself, that, he says, says Mill, is not a sufficient reason to compel that person to do something against his or her will. So these are good reasons uh, for remonstrating with him or reasoning with him or persuading him or entreating him, but not for compelling him or visiting him with any evil in case he do otherwise. Over himself, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. So I'm skipping a few sentences here and there. So you're, you are sovereign over your own body. You're free to do whatever you want so long as it doesn't harm anybody else. Now, there's a, a gray area. Maybe what you do or say doesn't directly and immediately harm somebody, but it might undermine certain institutions or beliefs of society which if they were to collapse would create great harm so um you know i i would think mill would say well you should err on the side of liberty if it's not a direct and immediate attack on anybody's welfare then let the person do as they see fit so i'll just keep reading here 458 this then is the appropriate region of human liberty it comprises first the inward domain of consciousness demanding liberty of conscience in the most comprehensive sense liberty of thought and feeling absolute freedom of opinion and sentiment on all subjects practical or speculative scientific moral or theological the liberty of expressing and publishing opinions may seem to fall under a different principle since it belongs to that part of the conduct of an individual which concerns other people, but being almost of as much importance as the liberty of thought itself and resting in great part on the same reasons is practically inseparable from it. So not only are you allowed to believe whatever you want and to do whatever you want so long as it doesn't harm anybody else, but you're allowed to publish your opinions and that, he says, he admits, well, that seems to be in a different region because now you're directly affecting others. But he says, no, it is so intimately linked with liberty of thought that the same rule applies. You can publish any opinion you want so long as it doesn't harm anybody else. So secondly, so all right, so this is what was the first point. This then is the appropriate region of human liberty. It comprises first the inward domain of, conscien of, of consciousness. Secondly, the principle requires liberty of tastes and pursuits of framing the plan of our life to suit our own character, of doing as we like, subject to such consequences as may follow, without impediment from our fellow creatures, so long as what we do does not harm them, even though they should think our conduct foolish, perverse, or wrong. So what is this third region of human liberty? Thirdly, from this liberty of each individual follows the liberty with this within the same limits of combination among individuals, freedom to unite for any purpose. All right, so you can believe what you want, you can publish your beliefs, and you can unite with any number of other people who share the same opinion. This is what we have in the United States of America in the First Amendment of the Constitution. It's the, it's the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, and this is what John Mill is saying. This is why it's so important. Even if the people who assemble freely are expressing opinions that are patently false and morally reprehensible if they are not directly harming anybody or I would assume actively planning to harm, conspiring a direct uh, plan to harm other people, then they should be allowed to combine and say whatever they want. So. Continuing on the right-hand side of page 458, the only freedom which deserves the name is that of pursuing our own good in our own way, so long as we do not attempt to deprive others of theirs or impede their efforts to obtain it. Each is the proper guardian of his own health, whether bodily or mental and spiritual. 
Mankind are greater gainers by suffering each other to live as seems good to themselves than by compelling each to live as seems good to the rest. So when I read this one, each is the proper guardian of his own health. So this is 2020, November 10, and vaccines are coming out for the coronavirus. A lot of people are very suspicious of vaccines, and many people will refuse to take the vaccine. Should that be allowed? I do believe it is legal in the United States. The argument against allowing people to refrain from having a vaccine would be that your action in this case is not involving only your own health, it's also involving other people's health. Is that potential threat to other people's health immediate enough to warrant preventing a person from being the guardian of his or her own health? That would be a philosophical question. I think as a utilitarian, um, it becomes even more interesting because, and, and John Stuart Mill's version of utilitarianism is more nuanced than Jeremy Bentham's because there's this act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism. The act utilitarianism is that any act, whatever act pr promotes the most happiness when you consider everybody involved, even if a minority or an individual has to be sacrificed to the greater good, any act that creates more happiness for the majority of people when everyone's considered as moral, regardless of what that act is. Rule utilitarianism would say, not any act is, is permissible. You can't kill one innocent, unwilling person in order to find the cure to heart disease, for example, in the other class I teach ethics, contemporary ethics, that's the example. Uh, there's certain rules when if we follow this rule generally it will lead to the greater happiness for the most people when everyone is considered and i think that's mills more leaning towards rule utilitarianism and one of the rules is this absolute granting absolute freedom to people to do and say and combine in any way they want so long as it doesn't harm other people okay so the Page 459, now, this, that, those were excerpts from chapter 1, and then I just took sections of those. This is chapter 2 of The Liberty of Thought and Discussion, 459. The time, it is to be hoped, is gone by when any defense would be necessary of the liberty of the press as one of the securities against corrupt or tyrannical government. Skipping a little bit, he says, Let us suppose, therefore, that the government is entirely at one with the people and never thinks of, ex of exerting any power of coercion unless in agreement with what it conceives to be their voice. But I deny the right of the people to exercise such coercion, either by themselves or by their government. The power itself is illegitimate. The best government has no more title to it than the worst. It is as noxious or more noxious when exerted in accordance with the public opinion than when in opposition to it. Okay, so the government gives freedom of press and it never thinks to go against the opinion of the majority. But this is where Mill is really getting serious here. He says that's, that's fine, but they should never go against the opinion of the minority either. And he goes on to give his reasons why. If all mankind minus one were of one opinion, and only one person were of the contrary opinion, mankind would be no more justified in silencing that one person than he, if he had the power, would be justified in silencing mankind. Skipping down a little, he says, But the peculiar evil of silencing the expression of an opinion is that it is robbing the human race, posterity as well as the existing generation, those who dissent, from the opinion still more than those who hold it. All right. If you silence alternative opinions, you're hurting the people who don't get to hear that opinion more than you're hurting the person that you're silencing. And this includes all the people in the future who won't have the benefit of hearing this alternative opinion. No, he says, number one, if the opinion is right, they are deprived of the opportunity of exchanging error for truth. Maybe this one person everybody else has one opinion but one person says no this is my opinion it might be right maybe you're missing the opportunity to, 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 uh, to take a great leap in philosophical knowledge so number two if wrong they lose what is almost as great a benefit the clearer perception and livelier impression of truth produced by its collision with error okay so 
First of all, you might be missing out on the next great truth. Secondly, even if it's false, when you collide truth with that false claim, you come to understand the truth even more clearly. And I know for a, a fact in my life, reading through these philosophy books, that I've come, I believe in God, I believe in the soul. I wrote a book about equating the soul with the gravitational singularity. And I definitely honed in my understanding of this cosmology, which is very similar to the Platonic cosmology and the Vedanta cosmology, by reading people who were totally against it, especially David Hume, who said, oh, there must, you want to believe in a self and an eternal, unchanging personal self? Well, it would have to correlate to some sense impression that includes every memory of your entire life, and it would have to be palpably present to your consciousness continuously and uninterruptedly. Every memory, every point from the past, present, and future would have to be directly perceived simultaneously and continuously. Only then would you have a true self, at least from an empiricist, an empiricist perspective. I said, well, that's a pretty tall order. However, strangely, during near-death experiences, that's exactly what people claim. My whole life flashed before my eyes. They head down a dark tunnel toward a brilliant point of light that contains the past, present, and future of the entire universe. And I showed how this is very similar to holographic string theory presented by an atheist, Leonard Susskind. He presented the cosmology as the antidote to the illusion of intelligent design. And he... I. He accidentally, it seems to me, gave a clear mathematical expression, at least according to the mathematicians who can judge his work, which I am not a member of that group. But apparently, even Stephen Hawking, before he died, admitted, yes, this model is superior to the model that Hawking had. That the past, the present, and the future, this is what Susskind and his partner Gerard de Hooft say, exist at every point of the encompassing horizon of the cosmos, and radiate in on threads of energy to create the holographic illusion of three-dimensional space evolving over time. So had I said, oh, he's an atheist, therefore whatever he says I know is, is grounded in error, so I'm not going to waste my time. And if I had the legal authority, I'd silence him because this atheism undermines the foundation of the idea of natural rights upon which our Constitution is founded. If I'd said that, I would have deprived myself of the greatest philosophical revelation that I've had for giving a scientific validation, or at least a scientific support for the Platonic and Vedanta philosophies. So at any rate, I agree with what he's saying here. And you can't have, you can't truly grasp the truth until you've seen it repeatedly attacked by the alternative opinions and that those who attack it with alternative opinions have to truly believe those alternative opinions. It can't just be one of your own group playing devil's advocate. He'll go on to say that. Okay, so he says, we can never be sure, this is 459, right-hand column, we can never be sure that the opinion we are endeavoring to stifle is a false opinion, and if we were sure, stifling it would be an evil still. First, the opinion, which is attempted to suppress uh, first, the opinion which it is attempted to suppress by authority may possibly be true. Those who desire to suppress it, of course, deny its truth, but they are not infallible. To refuse a hearing to an opinion because they are sure that it is false is to assume that their certainty is the same thing as absolute certainty. All silencing of discussion is, in its, is an assumption of infallibility. So that is, that is, I think, a big debate in academia today is in many universities and colleges will refuse certain groups, especially if they have a right wing leaning to hold assemblies and discuss their opinions with their group because they say, oh, these are repugnant opinions. They're generally accused of being racist and sexist and fascist. Well, Mill would say, you should absolutely let them speak unless I would assume they're actively planning some kind of a violent movement, but even if they just discuss the possibility of a violent revolution, the same way that 
communist philosophers do, I think Mill would say, then, then you should let them speak. Even if what they say is totally wrong and repugnant, it will, by giving it a hearing, strengthen the alternative and more true statement. So now I'm going to skip that part about while everybody admits that, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not infallible, I'm fallible, and yet when it comes to the opinions you really hold dear, then you just assume infallibility. You say, yeah, I, I'm not sure about everything, but I'm sure about this one thing. And he's, he's saying, you can't be sure absolutely about anything, because if you look back through history, you'll see that certain groups, well, I'll let him say it because he's more eloquent than I am. He says, people more happily situated who sometimes hear their opinions disputed and, and are not wholly unused to being set right when they are wrong, place the same unbounded reliance only on such of their opinions as are shared by all who surround them or to whom they habitually defer. For in proportion to a man's want of confidence in his own solitary judgment, does he usually repose with implicit trust on the infallibility of the world in general, and the world to each individual means the part of it with which he comes in contact, his party, his sect, his church, his class of society. The, ma uh, the man may be called by comparison almost liberal and large-minded to whom it means anything so comprehensive as his own country and his own age, nor is his faith in this collective authority at all shaken by his being aware that other ages, countries, sects, churches, classes, and parties have thought and even now think the exact reverse. He devotes he devolves upon his own world the responsibility of being in the right against the dissentient worlds of other people, and it never troubles him that the mere accident, that mere accident has decided which of these numerous worlds is the object of his reliance, and that the same causes which make him a churchman in London would have made him a Buddhist or a Confucian in Peking. Yet it is as evident in itself as any amount of argument can make it that ages are no more infallible than individuals every age having held many opinions which subsequent ages have deemed not only false but absurd, and it is as certain that many opinions now general will be rejected by future ages as it is that many once general are rejected by the present. All right, so I think that's a pretty good philosophical point. He's saying even people who are humble enough to realize, oh, I often make mistakes and I do need to have my opinions corrected. Fortunately for me, however, my church, my class of society, my political party, my nation, maybe even the zeitgeist of my age will, will instruct me. So even if the whole world agreed to something, there was not a single dissenter, or there was, I, there'd have to be one dissenter for it to become an issue, even if everyone on the earth but one person had shared one opinion, Mill is saying that doesn't mean that the whole world is right and that one person's wrong at all, because numerous opinions have been held by everybody in, in certain groups, and they can be larger and larger, and then they're completely rejected by later ages. So just because in one age everyone agrees doesn't mean that's going to be a, an accepted opinion in the next age, in the next millennia or century or decade. All right, so then he comes in and he plays devil's advocate against what he's been saying. He says, the objection likely to be made to this argument would probably take some such form as the following. So I'll just skip a little bit. He says, to prohibit what they think pernicious is not claiming exemption from error, but fulfilling the duty incumbent on them, although fallible, of acting on their conscientious conviction. So, he, so the, the devil's argument against giving people total liberty to say and do what they want as so long as it doesn't harm anybody else, is that we're not claiming to be infallible, but we have to make laws, we have to tax people. You, just because some people think paying taxes is wrong, does that mean we don't have the right to levy taxes? And just because we're pretty sure that what this person is saying is perverse and erodes the foundations of society, just because we can't be absolutely sure, does that mean that we should completely refuse to act and allow the foundations of society to be eroded away by these self-evidently incorrect ideas? And then he'll say, um, because I answer that it is assuming very much more. There is the greatest difference between presuming an opinion to be true because with every opportunity for contesting it, it has not been refuted, 
and assuming its truth for the purpose of not permitting its refutation. Complete liberty of contradicting and, dispro and disproving our opinion is the very condition which d justifies us in assuming its truth for purposes of action. And on no other terms can a being with human faculties have any rational assurance of being right. So the person is saying, we're not infallible, but we have to carry on the world. Unjust wars, unjust taxes have been levied. Does that mean we should never declare war or never levy taxes? We might make mistakes, but we have to act. And that's just the nature of the way things are. And what Mill is saying is laying taxes, going to war, that's one thing. But refusing a person to express their opinions is a totally different issue. And even if you're not going to gain the truth from that person's false opinion, the truth that you already hold will only be perfected once it's confronted by these contradictory opinions. And he's making a very big claim there. He says, on no other terms can a being with human faculties have any rational assurance of being right. Socrates would seem to support what he's saying because Socrates spent his entire life talking with people in the streets and finding flaws with their definitions of fundamental terms like justice and soul and the good. And it, so it would seem like Socrates would agree that there is no other way you can come to these, to this kind of knowledge of truth, that it requires, just like you can't sharpen um, a knife without a knife sharpener scraping against it, there needs to be some friction in order to produce the truth. This is what he's saying. And when you silence people's opinions because they are odious to you, you're not only harming them, more importantly, you're harming yourself and future generations by denying them the one and only avenue towards a certain understanding of truth. Even if your opinion is true and you hold it, if you hold it without knowing how to defend it against alternative viewpoints, you don't really understand it. So since you don't really understand it, it's really a superstition as far as you're concerned. All right, so, so he says on page 461, for on any matter not self-evident, there are 99 persons totally incapable of judging of it for one who is capable. And the capacity of the hundredth person is only comparative for the majority of the eminent men of every past generation held many opinions now known to be erroneous and did or approved numerous things which no one will now justify. All right, so if a thing isn't totally obvious and self-evident, such as the sky appears to be blue from a human being's perspective, if it's something like, for example, a scientific theory of gravity, for example, 99 out of 100 people aren't going to be able to explain the details of Isaac Newton's theory of gravity, much less Einstein's theory of general relativity, which replaced Newton's theory of gravity. And even among that 1% of people who could explain it, they have many disagreements, as we saw. Um, many people rejected Einstein's alternative theory of gravity initially, but then it passed some remarkable empirical tests, which made most people agree with it. But then Einstein himself rejected quantum mechanics. And then the problem is quantum mechanics and general relativity can't be combined, but you should only have one law of nature, many people believe. String theory is the attempt to unite those two. It works mathematically, but it can't be empirically observed because the strings are too tiny for current measuring devices. So there's all kinds of disagreement, even among the most eminent men of every past generation, he's saying. So this idea of we, we're certain of what we know, every, every eminent scientist agrees, that doesn't really mean that much, according to John Stuart Mill. For example, in my academic career, I do believe in God and a soul. I do not believe that consciousness comes from a random combination of material elements. And my main opposition to that belief is that those little material elements floating in three-dimensional space through a linear timeline that Isaac Newton described are no longer said to exist by 20th century physics. 
there are no little objectively existing ball bearings randomly combining in a void of three-dimensional space. Those little ball bearings are only act like little ball bearings when they're being directly measured. When they're not being measured, they act like waves of probability. And according to relativity theory, the past, the present, and the future coexist. So how, from a human perspective, it seems like we live on a timeline flowing steadily along from the past to the future. But from the mathematical description of space-time, the past, present, and future coexist. So to say that, oh, along a certain point on the timeline, consciousness suddenly emerged from matter, that theory, which makes a lot of sense in the Newtonian paradigm, doesn't make sense in the quantum relativistic string theory paradigm. Nevertheless, most eminent academics still hold to the Darwinian theory of the evolution of consciousness from insentient bits of matter. It's a big problem that I think needs to be rectified, but since the vast majority are of that opinion, expressing alternative opinions can be very dangerous to your academic career. I've, I'm not overly worried about it because I'm expressing this opinion in 31 minutes and 15 seconds into a video that I don't think too many academics are going to watch anyway, but it's also, I think, a good example of what John Stuart Mill is talking about here on Liberty. So 461 left-hand column. Um, this is a person who doesn't allow alternative opinions to be expressed. He's capable of rectifying his mistakes by discussion and experience, not by experience alone. There must be discussion to show how experience is to be interpreted. Wrong opinions and practices gradually yield to fact and argument, but facts and arguments to produce any effect on the mind must be brought before us, must be brought before it, before the mind. Very few facts are able to tell their own story without comments to bring out their meaning. The whole strength and value, then, of human judgment depending on the one property that it can be set right when it is wrong. All right, so the whole strength and value, then, of human judgment depending on the one property that it can be set right when it is wrong. Reliance can be placed on it only when the means of setting it right are kept constantly at hand. So, again, he's using a lot of absolutist terms. Earlier, he said, on no other terms can a human being be sure of having the truth other than discussing alternative perspectives. And here he says, the whole strength and value of human judgment depends on the one property that it can be set right. It's open to correction. A little lower down in the left-hand column, because it has been his practice to listen to all that could be said against him, to profit by as much of it as was just, and to expound to himself and upon occasions to others the fallacy of what was fallacious. This is the benefit of hearing alternative perspectives. Um, studying all modes in which it can be looked at by every character of mind. No wise man ever acquired his wisdom in any mode but this. Nor is it in the nature of human intellect to become wise in any other manner. The steady habit of correcting and completing his own opinion by collating it with those of others so far from causing doubt and hesitation and carrying it into practice is the only stable foundation for a just reliance on it for being cognizant of all that can, at least obviously, be said against him, and having taken up his position against all gainsayers, knowing that he has sought for objections and difficulties instead of avoiding them, and has shut out no light which can be thrown upon the subject from any quarter, he has a right to think his judgment better than those of any person or any multitude who have not gone through a similar process. So there he's saying. There's no other way. There is no other way. There is no other mode. There is no other strategy other than by taking your opinion and not willingly but begrudgingly hearing other opinions, but seeking them out, seeking out the very best expounders of the alternative opinions against your own, hearing what they have to say, accepting whatever you think might add to your understanding, and then explaining why the other parts of the other person's argument are wrong. That's the only way that you can have a firm conviction in the trustworthiness of your own opinions. And even then, he would say, that's no guarantee of infallibility. Because in a different age, in light of new evidence, which you believe might be considered completely erroneous. So, um, so here he's going to say, let's give an example um, of an opinion that might be considered odious but should nevertheless be given a fair opinion. Let the opinions impugned be the belief in a God and in a future state. 
so he's so then he's speaking on behalf of his critics oh okay so that's what you don't believe in i get what you're saying you're just arguing really for the freedom to attack god and religion and he's saying no that's not the case look what happened when people didn't allow others to express their opinions about god and religion it ended up in the majority putting to death two great human beings socrates and jesus so this was his point the people who put them to death were certain of their own moral correctness and the evil intentions of socrates and jesus and yet in our age there are no two people who are more revered and respected for their moral perfection and dedication to the truth so i will leave it at that i think it's a good point that just because you're on the side of the people who claim to be the defenders of of religious morality doesn't mean that you might be on the wrong side and that future ages might see that as the case so it's better to let people express their own opinions about god because what you might have originally interpreted as as atheism for example in the case of socrates might not be that case at all and with jesus it was blasphemy and yet most people consider him a moral paragon and, and there's an entire world religion that's the foundation of western civilization okay but for the sake of a little bit of brevity i am going to continue here right hand column page 462 let us now pass to the second division of the argument in dismissing the supposition that any of the received opinions may be false let us assume them to be true and examine into the worth of the manner in which they are likely to be held when their truth is not freely and openly canvassed he says that if it, is, if it is not fully, frequently, and fearlessly discussed, it will be held as a dead dogma, not a living truth. Okay, so now, let's just assume that you've got the truth. Still, just assuming even infallibility in this moral opinion, still it needs to be constantly challenged, because a truth not understood is just the same as a superstition. So the right, uh, left-hand column, 463, such persons, if they can once get their creed taught from authority, naturally think that no good and some harm may come of its being allowed to be questioned. Where their influence prevails, they make it nearly impossible for the received opinion to be rejected wisely and considerately, though it may still be rejected rashly and ignorantly, for to shut out discussion entirely is seldom possible, and when it once gets in, the leaps not grounded on conviction are apt to give way before the slightest semblance of an argument. All right, so this is the accusation made against academia in the United States of America today. Not every institution, but certainly the accusation has been made that certain people in academia, if they can once get their creed taught from authority, naturally think that no good and some harm comes of its being allowed to be questioned. Certainly the case that whether it's true or not, it is certainly the case the accusation has been made. And I think in this instance, where there's smoke, there's fire. There is a lot of, as de Tocqueville himself said, there's no nation on earth where freedom of discussion is so limited as in the United States of America. And that's because of the power of the majority in a democracy. Okay, so, and then he goes on to say, since you don't allow that received opinion, even if it's true, to be questioned, Whenever a counter-argument does slip through the cracks, the impressionable minds for the, oh, I didn't know that there was any alternative perspective. Oh, here comes one. Oh, it must be true. So he's saying, you put the true doctrine that you defend so vigorously against alternative opinions at risk itself from being supplanted by the very opinions that you refuse to hear. Had you give them a fair if, had you given them a fair hearing, you could have exposed their error. But instead, you try to suppress them. Now they sneak through. And since they're not being directly considered for their rational value, an impressionable mind might just Im immediately take up that erroneous point of view. So he goes on to say, waiving, however, this possibility, assuming that the true opinion abides in the mind, but abides as a prejudice, a belief independent of and proof against argument, this is not the way in which truth ought to be held by a rational being. This is not knowing the truth. Truth, thus held, is but one superstition the more, 
accidentally clinging to the wor uh, words which enunciated truth. All right, if you don't understand the foundation and the grounds of your opinions, then you don't really understand your opinions. You just parrot what you've been told. And that is not the truth. That's just an accidental coincidence. You happen to be saying something that's true, but you're not speaking the truth because you don't understand the words that you're using. And this was something that Socrates was always trying to point out to people, which really made him distasteful to the authority figures whom he repeatedly revealed to be not very reasonable people. So he goes on to say, whatever people believe on subjects on which it is of the first importance to believe rightly, they ought to be able to defend against at least the common objections. But someone may say, let them be taught the grounds of their opinions. It does not follow that opinions must be merely parroted because they are never heard uh, controverted. So then he's saying, that you need to hear it from the people who believe it, not just from those playing devil's advocate. No matter how thoroughly the partisan of your own party plays the devil's advocate by arguing from the other party's perspective, it will lack that passion and conviction which someone who really holds it would have in its, in its defense. And then he goes, and then he says, persons who learn geometry do not simply commit the theorems to memory, but understand and learn likewise the demonstrations. And it would be absurd to say that they remain ignorant of the grounds of geometrical truths because they never hear anyone deny and attempt to disprove them. Okay, so, oh, I have to hear alternative perspectives. So when I say 2 plus 2 equals 4, if someone else says 2 plus 2 equals 5, I need to learn something from that idiot? And then no one say, no, mathematics is a peculiar situation, although I don't think, um, I mean, for example, is there such a thing as the square root of negative one? By the rules of mathematics, you can't multiply any two numbers, either even or two odd numbers or an even and an odd number and come out um, with, so it's the square root of negative one. Negative one times negative one is one. So what's the square root of negative one? What number times itself equals negative one. There is, there are no two numbers times themselves that equal negative one. So you have to have this imaginary unit. Anyway, my point is even in the realm of mathematics, what might seem like self-evident truth isn't always the case, but Mill is granting that mathematics is a, is a unique situation. He says, undoubtedly, and such teaching suffices on a subject like math like mathematics, where there is nothing at all to be said on the wrong side of the question. The peculiarity of the evidence of mathematical truth is that all the argument is on one side. There are no objections and no answers to objections, but on every subject on which difference of opinion is possible, the truth depends on a balance to be struck between two sets of conflicting reasons. Even in natural philosophy, there's always some other explanation possible of the same facts. So continuing a little bit, he says, and until this is shown, and until we know how it is shown, we do not understand the grounds of our opinion. But when we turn to subjects infinitely more complicated, to morals, religion, politics, social relations, and the business of life, three-fourths of the arguments for every disputed opinion consist in dispelling the appearances which favor some opinion different from it. Then he's talking about Cicero. He says, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. This is Cicero's opinion. He says, his reasons may be good, and no one may have been able to refute them, but if he's equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not so much as know what they are, he has no ground for preferring either opinion. Nor is it enough that he should hear the arguments of adversaries from his own teachers, presented as they state them, and accompanied by what they offer as reputation. Again, I, I went over this. He says, he must be able to hear them from persons who actually believe them, who defend them in earnest and do their very utmost for them. He must know them in their most plausible and persuasive form. Skipping down a little, this is 464 on the left. 99 and 100 of what are called educated men are in this condition, even of those who can argue fluently for their opinions. Their, their conclusion may be true, but it might be false for anything they know. They have never known themselves. They have never thrown themselves into the mental position of those who think differently from them and considered which such person, which such persons may have to say, and consequently they do not, in any proper sense of the word, know the doctrine which they themselves profess. 
We have now recognized the necessity to the mental well-being of mankind on which all their other well-being depends of freedom of opinion and freedom of the expression of opinion on four distinct grounds, which we will now briefly recapitulate. So this is a summary of everything he said. Why is it so important to give absolute freedom of, of speech and assembly and freedom of the press? He says, first, if any opinion is compelled to silence, that opinion may, for aught we certainly know, be true. To deny this is to assume our own infallibility. So to reject someone's, uh, uh, to suppress someone from expressing their opinion is to express your own belief in your own infallibility. Secondly, though the silenced opinion be an error, it may and very commonly does contain a portion of truth, so you need that to add to the truth that you already hold. Thirdly, even if the received opinion be not only true, but the whole truth, unless it is suffered to be and actually is vigorously and earnestly contested, the people who believe it will have no or very little rational grounds for believing it. And fourthly, the meaning of the doctrine itself will be in danger of being lost or enfeebled and deprived of its vital effect on the character and conduct, the dogma becoming a mere formal profession, inefficacious for good, but cumbering the ground and preventing the growth of any real and heartfelt conviction from reason or personal experience. So, if you don't allow a belief to be attacked, then even the people who believe it won't earnestly believe it anymore. It'll just become some conviction that they've been forced to adopt and they won't have a heartfelt connection to it. Okay, so I think that's a pretty good summary of John Stuart Mill on liberty.